Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. We are joined by members of the Appalachian Audubon Society. We have with us Vice President Allie Bowling and a board, um, board member Georgina Kale. Kegel, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, today we are going to be chatting with these lovely ladies about winter bird watching and feeding and all the lovely feathered friends you will see in your backyard this time of year um, and how to keep them well fed and so they want to hang around, right? <laughs> so um, without further ado, we'll let Allie take it away. Um, and I just want to remind our viewers that if you have any questions during the presentation, please leave them in the comments and um, we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Hi everyone, um, and welcome to this learning adventure um, through technology nowadays. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk about my favorite subject of birds, so I hope you guys enjoy. If you have any questions, like um, Sarah said, put them in the comments, I'd be happy to answer them at the end, and Georgia's gonna help as well. So um, I wanted to start the presentation by giving a little background about who I am. Um, so I've worked with birds for a lot of years um, in Oklahoma during college and a little while after. I worked as a wildlife rehabilitator, um, so that's somebody who takes in wild animals and releases them back to the wild if they're injured or orphaned. Um, I specialized in birds, so I worked with about 3,500 birds a year. Um, we took in 7,000 animals a year, so it was a very cool experience. I got a lot of hands-on um, training with feeding animals, so this will be a fun a fun chat. Um, I also have a degree in environmental science from the University of Oklahoma. I currently work as, a, as an environmental specialist and I'm vice president of the Appalachian Audubon Society. Uh, I'm an animal care volunteer and board member of West Shore Wildlife Center, so it's a local wildlife rehabilitation center um, to the central PA area. And I'm also a part of the Contiguinet Watershed Association. So a little outline, we're gonna go over Backyard Birding 101. So the six W's of bird identification. Um, I thought it'd be a fun way of, of coming up with uh, tips to remember how to identify birds. Uh, then we'll talk about backyard feeding, uh, the do's and don'ts, and then I'll have some references that in the future you can use and we'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. So, when I think about bird identification, um, it can be a little overwhelming. There's a lot of birds out there, and um, I think that keeps people away from birding sometimes. So in order to make it a little bit more simple, I come up with four main groups of birds. So you have your raptors, which is your hunters. You can look for powerful, powerful talons or curved beaks um, for meat eating. You have your songbirds, your perched birds. Um, usually they're very vocal. There's a large variety of songbirds. So it's probably gonna be the most common bird you'd see in your backyard, unless you're living on a pond, lucky you. Um, and then you have your shorebirds, which would be in shallow water. They generally have long skinny legs, long beaks, you know, for their habitat. And then waterfowl. So that's your web feet um, birds that are commonly found in flocks or in couples and uh, often found swimming. So I think this makes it a little bit more simple to start your classification or identification of birds and makes it um, kind of basic. And so when you're thinking of feeding birds, I think identification is the first step, which is why we're gonna talk about birding first. Because if you can understand just simple things about birds, like their beak, um, a simple thicker beak is for cracking seed. So you can know what you're going to feed in your backyard and attract the birds you want. So, the six W's, as I'm gonna call it, um, for bird identification is when and where, so you can think of um, habitat, we'll go over all of these, who, uh, so your characteristics and color, what and why, behavior, and with, so what with the calls that they're calling, um, you can listen and identify birds that way. So I came up with this little bit, um, 
actually from the business side of my job, there's the five whys that you can use for uh, finding the root cause to a, a problem. So it's a little bit of critical thinking and I thought it would be fun to kind of come up with that for bird identification. So the first step I would say in backyard birding is to look at when you're birding. So what season is it? Birds uh, in your backyard change in the wintertime versus the summertime, whether it's breeding season or migration. So uh, look, thinking of what season you're looking at is important. The time of day um, that you're looking is also important. You know, a certain bird shouldn't be out in the evening time or nighttime, and, and some birds prefer morning. So having an idea of the time of day um, can also help you identify what bird you're looking at. Range maps, so where, um, is a huge benefit. If you uh, look through a birding book, you'll find these maps, which um, can give you an idea of who is in your area, what time of year, and, and permanently. So you can have just a, an understanding of what you might see in your backyard. Um, to the right here is an example of a range map for the American goldfinch. As you can see uh, that the finch is a permanent resident in Pennsylvania, which means it's here in the spring, summer, fall, uh, winter, any season. So you can you know, have an idea that you might see that at your feeder. If you're in Texas, then it's um, probably not going to be seen during the spring and summer, but during the winter of a non-breeding resident. Um, so it's good to have an understanding of what birds are common in your area. If you put those two things together, your whens and wheres, um, you can find your probability of knowing what you might see. So you can you can have an idea of what's going to be your highest chance um, if you're going to see a permanent resident or a, a migrating bird. So your characteristics. Um, I split it into two ways because I think um, if you look at detail too soon, it can be difficult. So I think the first step of who you're looking at is look at the overall shape of your bird and, and just overall characteristics. So I thought this black vulture would be a good example of that because there's not a lot of detail. You can look at the body shape. So is it long and tall? Um, think of a, like a great blue heron. Does it have a very long neck? Then you, know, you might get an idea of what the bird is. Is it short and wide? Um, some of those body shapes can be very helpful. Body size, so large, small, or tiny. <laughs> um, looking at your, your bird is relative to other birds is very helpful. So if you think of a hummingbird versus a black vulture, you can see a huge scale. Um, but if you think of a hummingbird versus a cardinal, um, you know, there's a little bit of a smaller scale there. So one's tiny and one's maybe small. Um, so once you get to I understand a wide variety of birds. The bird size is a little bit easier. Um, you can look at posture, so whether it's vertical versus horizontal. So if the bird is commonly perched upright, like a hawk, or if they are swimming vertically, like a duck. So those things like posture can be very helpful. Foot shape, so that's a big one, like we saw in the chart previously. Um, if they have three, toes forward and two forward to or two forward toes um, it can kind of tell you what kind of bird you're looking at a lot of different birds have different um, shaped feet so if you think of a paddle uh, bill shape is another one so if they have a large beak um, if you think compared to body size so if you think of the cardinal and how large their beak is um, you can think they probably eat seed. They need that, that thick beak to crack. Um, but if you see like the vulture here doesn't have that thick beak, it has a curved beak at the end for meat tearing. So those bill shapes can be really important when you're trying to figure out what to feed birds. Um, I've always said that a cardinal bite is the worst bird bite I've, I've ever experienced. I will not get bit by a cardinal. Um, I've been bit by crows but <laughs> that's okay cardinals are no go it's their beak is so large and strong then the wing shape so there's different shapes um, based on what the bird needs them for so large birds would need them for gliding a vibrating wing for hoverings like a hummingbird so just having some idea of wing shapes can be very helpful when you're trying to just do a basic identification 
So the second part of who is more of the detailed um, looking at the bird. So uh, for example, looking at color. So even just shades, light and dark. In this first picture on the right, um, I think it's a good example. It's a picture I took at our local grocery store um, in my town. I was just returning my cart and happened to look up. Um, and I recommend looking up wherever you are because I think it's um, so under underestimated how many birds you can see. But um, you can see here from this picture, I can't see any specific details other than the light and dark shades. I can see that it's a probably a larger bird. I know it's hard to see the height of it, but it's pretty high up. Um, and if it was a small bird, I wouldn't be able to see it. So it's probably a pretty big bird. You can see the dark band in the middle of its wings, and then you can see the white of its head and the white of its tail. And that would probably most likely be a bald eagle. So it was a simple light and dark shades that I was able to identify what that bird was just by looking. Um, and then once you kind of have those things down, I would say a little bit more advanced would be your uh, smaller differences in faint of color and patterns. So when you look at sparrows, um, they can often have different color patterns that can tell them apart. It's very subtle. Um, so once you kind of get more into birding and, and have it down a little bit, um, like more broad, then I would start working on, okay, can I tell the difference between two birds by the band on its eye? So it's, it can get very specific, but I think starting broad, looking at dark and light shades, looking at basics, it, it's a little bit more simplified. Then you can start learning some of those more detailed um, identification marks. So this uh, other picture on the right that I had taken, um, a blue jay is a pretty easy bird to identify by color. So bright, bold colors can make it a little easier sometimes. Um, if you think of cardinals, uh, male cardinals, they're pretty easy to identify because they're bright red. And they can help you tell male and female sometimes the colors. So a uh, male cardinal is bright red, where a female is a, a browner color. Um, and so, you know, color is important, but I wouldn't say it's the first place I would start. So here um, is a video um, I had taken of some vultures flying. So uh, I think the third step in backyard birding is the what and why, so behavior. Um, if I look at posture, so some backyard birds are gonna be more nervous or skittish or bold and assertive. If you think of a, a blue jay flying in, and that's bold and assertive, um, that can help you decide maybe the difference between that and um, maybe a cardinal where it's a little, little bit more timid of you being outside. So those posturings can help movement. So are they fast like a hummingbird or moving a little bit slower, I would say like a dove? Um, is it hopping or running, submerging underwater? So I think those movements can be very telling of what it is. So for example, in this video, there's a lot of uh, gliding, so flight patterns, and they're in a large uh, group, which vultures in a large group is called a kettle. Uh, so they're probably migrating. Um, it's a common thing you'll see, and they ride the warm air currents upwards in groups. So it was helpful to identify the basic of what kind of bird it is. So um, the fourth with call is the uh, fourth recommendation I have. So I think calls can be very difficult. Um, this is a video I had taken of a crow, an American crow making a very interesting call. Um, songs I think are if you learn some basic songs of birds, it can be very helpful because you can learn their tones, but some birds do mimic. So I, I do um, say use caution when using uh, calls to uh, identify birds when you first start out. I think once you start getting an understanding of birding, um, calls can be very helpful. You can identify where a bird is by the call. That's pretty simple. Um, but once you start being more advanced and you can understand the, the different sounds that birds make, it can be useful to know it's in your backyard. 
So if you think of um, songs versus calls, so songbirds can use a generally complex um, pattern. So a lot of song sparrows. If you think of in the evening, you can hear a song or a robin in the springtime. Um, you can kind of identify a bird based on that song. Uh, calls are shorter and simpler, often urgent. So blue jays often use calls. The tones that bird uses. Um, why I say use caution is because um, I have a blue jay in my backyard that often mimics a, a red-shouldered hawk. And so I can tell it's mimicking because the tone is slightly off versus an actual red-shouldered hawk. But it, it's, it would be a little hard to tell if I, if I hadn't personally been around both of those birds many times. So I, I say once you start learning those tones, it gets easier. But I would recommend watching YouTube videos of, of calls that are common in your area just to kind of get used to, to things like that. Other noises that are a little bit simpler are drumming on wood, wings in flight, and shuffling leaves. So those can all be indicators of where the bird might be so you can, you can look to identify it. Okay, so I have a little practice video. This is my backyard just the other day. Um, these are only half of my feeders. <laughs> I, have a, I have a feeding problem. Um, so when I look to identify the birds, I think when and where. So I'm in central Pennsylvania. It's cold, obviously snowing, winter time. Um, and I think it's during the day, there's, there's light out there. Um, so then I think characteristics. Okay, so in the middle um, of the video, you can see a bright red color. So I would say that's a male cardinal. More under the tree, I would say there's a bird that's uh, more vertical or more horizontal and um, just walking around. Let me see if I can play the video again. Um, what are they doing? They're feeding underneath bird feeders. And they unfortunately, there's no sound, but based on where I am, they're under a feeder. I would say it's a smaller bird, not tiny. Um, I would say probably a dove knowing what my feeders look like. And then next to it, I know that sparrows and, and juncos are common to the area during this time of year. So, and they're relatively small, um, on, on borderline tiny. So I would, I would say it's a junco, dark-eyed junco or um, some sort of sparrow. There's a couple of varieties in, in the backyards here. So that's kind of a little bit of an idea um, of how I would go about identifying. Now, having a birding book and I'll talk about that a little bit later, is, is very helpful, um, especially when you're starting out. There are apps, so I could use this video um, and take a picture of it and put it in an app, and it can help me identify what birds I've seen in my backyard. So now we understand a little bit of how to identify the birds in our backyard, and now we can understand maybe how to feed them. So identification is, is really key in understanding what my backyard might hold and what kind of bird feeder I want to provide and what I want to attract. So um, if I, you know, want to have more of a bigger bird or a bird that isn't commonly like perching, um, I would go with a platform feeder. So for your doves that can't really get onto like a tube feeder, we'll get that to that one next, um, that would like more of a flat area because they're more of that horizontal type of bird. Um, I would go with a, a platform feeder. Your cardinals and blue jays also prefer a platform feeder. I have seen cardinals at a tube feeder, um, but I would say they generally go for that platform. And if you want to go with a tube feeder, I do see those platform feeders feed underneath those. So if they, if the other birds eating at the tube feeder kick seed out, they will feed on the ground. So you don't have to have a platform feeder. You can choose one of these. Um, it can be beneficial for all of the birds, or you can have many as I do. Um, tube feeders are often for smaller birds. And you can see the picture on the right here, what a tube feeder is. So it's an actual tube with little perches coming out of the smaller holes. So finches and sparrows are most common, I would say, with a tube feeder. And then specific feeders for specific birds. So you can get a suet feeder, um, and we'll talk about what suet is in the next slide, but they're commonly used for woodpeckers and wrens, and honestly, a lot of birds like, like suet, but I would say woodpeckers are probably the most common. 
You can get a mealworm feeder. Um, so it would kind of look similar to the wire mesh with peanuts, but maybe have a little covering over the top or over the sides. Um, those are most commonly used for bluebirds, things that eat mealworms. And then you have your peanuts uh, feeders for more like blue jays. And then your nectar feeders for hummingbirds. So that would be for a liquid diet. And they have often like a red flower to attract the hummingbirds to the feeder. Um, so there's a lot of variety and it just depends on what you wanna attract and what you can possibly have in your backyard. So here's a list, it's kind of large, but of all the different types of seed that you could have um, options of. And here's a picture of some ducks um, that are, are enjoying some lettuce and tomatoes, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but your first most common seed is your black oil sunflower seed. So um, I would say that's the best starter seed personally, that's common, affordable. Um, I know there's a little bit of a shortage right now in some seeds because everybody is getting into birding, which is awesome. But I would say it's it's the best um, for people starting to feed in their backyards. It's going to attract a wide variety of birds. Um, I have a, a lot that enjoy black oil sunflower. Um, the next one option would be a smaller seed of thistle, which is more for your finches. Uh, you have to have a, a feeder with smaller holes. Um, I would say for the black oil sunflower, going back for one moment, um, you could just toss them on the ground too. You don't have to have a feeder. If you, if you want something low um, upkeep and affordable, you can just toss some seed on the ground and birds will come in and, and feed regularly. Um, so then the thistle, you would have to have a smaller feeder with holes generally. Um, that's how your finches like to eat. So that's gonna attract some of those smaller birds. Seed mixes, um, I personally use a seed mix and I mix it with extra black oil sunflower seeds, but um, the seed mixes are good. They can have a wide variety of, of things in it. So mine has peanuts, um, millet, black oil sunflower. I think it has some uh, cracked uh, sunflower seeds already pre-done for them. <laughs> um, so, you know, I would recommend seed mixes, but they do sometimes have unwanted seed that birds really don't like, um, and they'll toss it out on the ground, so it's a little messy. But I find that the doves will go in and clean it up, but um, it is a little bit of a messier option. So then the suet option is usually an animal fat-based um, protein that, that birds can eat in the winter months. I recommend, I know they have um, non-melting suet, so you could do that in more of the summer months, but I generally feed it only in the winter, and that's what I would recommend. Um, you have to be careful because, and I'll, I'll get into that in the don'ts, but um, suet can melt on bird feathers, so you just have to be a little careful of that. And suet has often seed mixed in, and you can hang it in a little cage situation. You can make your own suet. Audubon, um, National Audubon has some great suet recipes online. Um, and then nectar, so there's uh, hummingbird feeders, and I have heard of Orioles feeding from them as well. And you can mix a uh, sugar water in a specific ratio. You can find that online as well um, through National Audubon. And you can feed it through the hummingbird feeder. They will fly up and feed through the little tubes. And I would, I would recommend that, but you have to clean it pretty often. So just keep that in mind. And then the specials. So um, you can throw in some special treats. So for the snowstorm, I got some peanuts and threw them out there for some, some blue jays. But um, so peanuts, cracked corn, millet, oranges um, are common for Orioles to attract Orioles. And then lettuce and tomatoes for ducks and geese. If you're going to your local pond to feed, or if you have a pond in your backyard and you want to feed, I'd recommend lettuce and tomatoes. It's um, more nutritious than bread. Bread can cause a lot of dietary problems, especially in a growing duck or a goose. Um, it can really damage their ability to fly. So lettuce and tomato has a good, some nutritional value. So that's what I would recommend feeding. So the backyard feeding do. Um, so this is a, a recent feeding, feeder purchase that I made for my um, window. It's mostly for my cats, but they're indoor cats, but they um, enjoy to watch the birds. So um, 
I do try to make sure my feeders are near protection. So if you can see below that feeder, there's a bush there. There's actually bush to the right and to the left. So if they feel the need for protection, um, a hawk flies in or, you know, person walks by, they have that ability to go and hide. So I recommend having protection nearby. If um, you're concerned with window strikes, and it's a, it's obviously a big issue for birds, um, you can use soapy water to streak the windows uh, so the birds can see them, and it can help, you know, not have any collisions with windows. You'll clean your feeders every couple of weeks with soap and disinfectant. There's some good tips online um, to find a disinfectant ratio that you can use. I would store seed in metal closed containers. I say metal because um, plastic, I can almost guarantee your squirrels will get into if you're keeping it outside. I made that mistake um, earlier in the season. And so metal has been great. It's, it's worked to keep all the um, other wildlife out, provide water. So um, having a bird bath can actually attract more birds than, than some of your feeders will attract. For example, I have some robins that won't feed from my feeders. They like little worms in the ground outside, but they will come to my bird bath. So having a bird bath nearby can even provide more options um, for birds. And a variety of feeders can help attract many types of birds. I personally live in a pretty urban area. Um, as you can see, it's a, it's a development, a townhouse development. And I have had over 20 species of birds this year. Um, probably even maybe 30, just because I have a variety of feeders outside and bird baths and, you know, um, it doesn't, you don't have to be in a rural area to see a lot of different types of birds. So the don'ts. Um, this is a, a picture I actually took right outside of my work window now, my uh, home window, um, through a lens of a binocular. Um, of a Cooper's hawk watching my my bird feeder. So um, the don'ts, I don't feed where they're wild, where wild cats frequent. So wild cats are a really big um, issue for bird populations. Um, they kill, uh, I think, 2.3 billion birds a year and they're not natural predators. So I, I would be very cautious if you have wild cats in the area. Don't feed birds bread. Uh, we already kind of talked about that. The nutritional value is not very good. Um, don't leave suet out during the summer if it is possibly going to melt um, on bird feathers. It's it's kind of like an oil um, where how bird, bird feathers work is it's sort of a lock in key um, situation. And if oil gets on the feathers, it can't do that lock in key. Um, so the birds will be exposed underneath their feathers to the, all the elements of rain and um, cold weather and things like that. So it's important not to get their feathers uh, possibly dirty. And sticky traps, don't use sticky traps or grease to deter mice or squirrels in the area. I have heard those tricks before um, and I've seen the outcome and it's not good. Sticky traps um, are not Birds also often get stuck on sticky traps as well, smaller birds, and so it can be dangerous for them. I would also add not to use um, insecticides or rodenticides. Both of those can affect your birds in the area. So if you're using either of those, I highly recommend you don't feed or don't use them. Um, and then I would like to add in that this Cooper's hawk is probably going to eat a bird at my feeder, and I know that can be hard to watch, but I never would stop that interaction um, because it is a natural predator and the Cooper's hawk has to eat too. So if you see those sort of things happening, either you can take your feeders down and the, the hawk will move on, or you can you know, just enjoy the circle of life, have an ecosystem in your backyard is what I always think. I have a full ecosystem. I feed the squirrels as well. So um, kind of enjoy that, that circle of life. So a couple of reference options that I would recommend. Um, I found this cool website, Common Feeder Birds. It's Feeder Watch. I think it's through Cornell um, Bird Lab of Ornithology. Um, and it can help you decide what to feed based on what birds you want to attract. So hopefully we can uh, put the link in the comments of this uh, presentation and you can check it out.
their phone app. So eBird um, is a great one. And eBird, you can actually post your sightings and, and be part of citizen science. So there's ways that you can actually um, use data that you have found in your of birds in your backyard uh, for science. So that's kind of cool. Merlin Bird ID, I personally use that sometimes. Um, that's an app that you can take a picture and it will help you identify a bird. iNaturalist has been recommended to me. Um, so I've heard great things about it. I personally haven't used it, but I would recommend it um, based on other uh, avid birders using it. And two books that I would recommend, I see I made a little typo there, but The Sibley Guide to Birds. So um, highly recommend, it's a great book. And National Geographic Field Guides. Um, so both of those are good to have on hand uh, in case you see a bird outside and you want to identify it. And then I have um, a last little video I'd love to share of a, a surrogate vulture feeding an orphan baby vulture. I was lucky enough to, to be a part of that. There's some food we just can't provide, only mothers can. Um, and so vultures are personally my favorite birds. Um, and I think that their babies are adorable and fluffy. Um, so that was a, a very cool moment. I think a lot of people don't get to see. So I try to share it as often as I can. So don't forget to enjoy your birds outside. And if you have any questions, I'm sure myself or Georgia would be happy to answer. Thank you. I have some things I'd like to add to. Oh yeah, please. Are we ready? I, I can't hear you, Sarah. You're muted. Yep, I got it now. Thanks, <laughs> Georgia. Thank you. You're all set. <laughs> um, I usually recommend Pennsylvania specific books for um, people who are just starting out. It really narrows down the field. So we have this one, uh, it's by Haas and Burroughs, and we have another one that is by Stan Tequila. So um, those are both great books. And you kind of touched on it, but Project Feeder Watch with Cornell Lab of Ornithology, so you go in there and put in Northeast birds, or if you want to look at a particular bird, it'll tell you the seeds it eats, the type of feeders it, eat out, it eats out of, and um, you know you can really narrow it down and, and simplify things for yourself. I recommend a 10% bleach solution for cleaning your feeders. And every time it rains, when we had that rain a couple weeks ago, I had to clean every one of my feeders because the bottom, um, gets soaked and then that will mold in there and that kills birds. So you want to um, make sure you keep your feeders clean and you don't, you know, just let that accumulate in there. And I kind of even have some sticks that in the two feeders that I can dig the stuff out if it wasn't bad enough that the whole thing needs cleaned. And um, that's about what I wanted to add. I'll just say that I, I, um, I've been bird feeding since I was four years old when my dad first had a feeder built for me. I didn't make feeders back then. So I started really feeding back in the 80s when um, a lot of these wild bird stores started opening and I would travel for work down around Washington, D.C. or out towards Philly and I would be able to buy feeders. As it's moved along, I've gone to more squirrel proof feeders and um, caged feeders for the finches and the feeders that um, go down if a squirrel gets on it and usually just leave one feeder open for the birds although they eat off the ground and um, you know you can really just start out with basic and you can move up then to um, more specialized feeders based on your problems and starlings are a problem and um, that's where I have I cut back on peanuts and suet and everything that the starlings eat because I, I just can't stand them. I also have bluebird feeders. So if you like bluebirds, they do stay all winter. I ha I've had loads of them out here. I feed them mealworms. Um, they eat some shelled peanuts. They eat some um, shelled sunflower seed. And I also have a suet dough that I put out for them. And um, Plenty of different kinds of food. Some people I know use only those seed cylinders and they have great success in their yards without having to fill feeders every day. Mine, mine need filled all the time, except for right now I have a 
hawk hanging around, and so most of the finches have gone. And I had over 100 pine siskins in the fall, so I was really concerned because they were just hogging the food. Um, that's about it. Um, bird baths will actually attract more birds um, on occasion than feeders in the winter, heated bird baths. You can buy immersible heaters that go in any bird bath you have. And you can also buy bird baths that have a, a feed, um, the heater right built into the bird bath. And my bluebirds are at the feeder right outside my kitchen window all the time. So I, I really enjoy the baths in the winter, except for the fact that the deer drink the one dry every night. So um, I shovel my paths to my feeders. I shovel under the feeders. Uh, if it's snowing during the day, I'm cleaning the feeders all day long. So I, I appreciate snows that come overnight and I can clean in the morning. But um, you don't have to worry about the birds if you aren't getting them filled right away. They Birds actually spend a very short period of their time at the feeders and they're out eating natural food. So you don't have to worry about them becoming dependent on your feeders or um, not migrating uh, in the spring or fall or anything like that. The, the birds know what to do um, naturally. So that's that's what I wanted to add to that. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for being here and sharing your passion and expertise. We really appreciate it. Um, and I, I hope everyone uh, starts feeding on their own or at least watching and seeing what kind of birds they can identify. I just mentioned um, three Facebook them. groups. There's PA Birders. There's Birding Pennsylvania. Those are two groups. And then there's one called ID That PA Bird. And you can, you know, describe the bird or put a picture in and people will give you hints on what the bird is. And then you can, you can, it helps you learn what to look at the wing bars or the beak or the, the feet or whatever. So um, I get a lot of information off of those sites. And Appalachian Audubon does have a Facebook page Crazy. as well. So if you're interested in local birding or bird watching or learning more um, and becoming part of a community, then please feel free to like us on Facebook. And um, we have memberships. We have um, chapter meetings monthly. So we'd be happy to have more, more people join us and talk about birds and conservation and other wildlife as well. And actually, you can join our meetings even without being wonderful, a member. Wonderful. So if you want to look us up and the meetings are on Zoom right now monthly. So um, you don't need to join to do that. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you both again very much for your time. Thank um, you. And, and we'll talk to you soon.